Hi friends, it's Becky here. Let's talk sourdough starters. They're all the rage right now. Everyone either has one, knows someone who has one, or knows someone who has the intention of starting one at some point. <laughs> this is a good thing. So how do you start and maintain your own? Let's start off with the biggest question. What is a sourdough starter? It's a medium that helps house your wild yeast and lactic acid bacteria, the same kind of bacteria that gives you yogurt and cheese. We're currently seeing a shortage of commercial dried yeast in grocery stores. With retail yeast in the US, there's generally two kinds you can find, active dry yeast and instant dry yeast. Both of them are harvested in vats of molasses, then dried, granulated, and covered in a protective coating. Then they sleep. They hang out in those innocent little packets until you wake them up and give them food to eat in the form of flour and water and maybe a few other things if you're spicing it up. There's also cake yeast, which is a brick of living yeast, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but what the heck is yeast? All yeast are single-celled microorganisms that tend to group together, and there are a bunch of different kinds. The ones we're looking for here are big fans of sugar and can stand up to an acidic environment. When these yeast cells eat that sugar, they burp out carbon dioxide and alcohol and have strength to make babies. With a sourdough starter, you're capturing wild yeast and bacteria from the air, from the flour, and even your own hands, and then giving them a happy pool of food to live in. What's nice about commercial yeast is that it's predictable. It's the same strains of yeast every time. When we're talking about sourdough starters, you're taming a wild stallion. You have to learn how to listen to it, learn what it needs, and be committed to what can be a lifelong, multi-generational relationship. Here's the deal. There are millions of different ways to start and maintain your sourdough starter. I'm gonna give you the simplest way I know. We're gonna make a flour and water paste. Under ideal circumstances, it's nice to start your sourdough starter with rye or whole wheat flour. They tend to have a higher amount of wild yeast naturally existing in the flour than conventional white flours, so it will kickstart your starter. But now, as always, we make the most with what we have. White flowers will also work, but they may take a little longer to get off the ground, more so if your flour is bleached. Let's take 100 grams of flour, ideally 50 grams of rye and 50 grams of bread flour, and 100 grams of warmish water and mix it into a paste. Your yeast are happiest in a warm blanket of gluten. Too cold and they get sleepy, too hot and you've killed them off. So water that's just a little warm is best, warmish. If you're using American units of measure, it's roughly two-thirds cups of flour and one-third cup of water. Remember when you're measuring, you'll want to use two different tools. There are liquid measuring cups that are clear and have markings on the side, and there are dry cup measures that you level off. Each one will help you more accurately measure your ingredients. If your goal is to make bread with your sourdough starter, you'll want to invest in a scale though. In weighing your ingredients, you're increasing your chances of creating a more stable product in an environment that already has so many other variables at play. If you are truly married to the idea of not purchasing a scale, there are plenty of non-bread recipes that you can use your starter to make. And you can still make bread, it's just going to be a little inconsistent. Also know that we can start our starter with smaller quantities. We can have everything. This will be easier if you have a scale. If you don't, you're going to have to eyeball it, but do what feels comfortable and right for you. Okay, so we have our ingredients for our starter. Flour and water. Yep, that's it. Now, how do you store this puppy? You're going to want a clear container. Glass or food grade plastic works. I have quite a few quart containers in my house, so that's my preference. I say clear container because you want to be able to see the rise and fall of your starter. That's how you're going to learn its patterns and develop a healthy feeding schedule for the two of you. You also want to give your starter room to grow and breathe. Your starter will more than double in size, so we have to take that into account. And remember how we said our yeast burps out carbon dioxide? We don't want all that air accumulating in tightly sealed jars, so you have to give it space to breathe. You can put a lid on your glass jar without attaching the seal if it's a two-piece lid. If your lid and seal are a single deal, you can just loosely close it. With the plastic, I have enough grow space and my top is flexible, so my starter has a chance to breathe. If you do not have any of these options, you can use muslin, cheesecloth, or coffee filters and just seal them over your jar with a rubber band. Necessity is the mother of invention. We can jerry-rig the whole thing, but the main thing is to keep it lightly covered in a warm spot in your home. It makes it an inviting place for our new buddies to call their own. Great, we have our containment vessel, we have our ingredients, now we mix. We're going to use a spoon, a spatula, or our hands to get in there and mix that flour and water. You want to make sure that all the flour is well incorporated and hydrated. You don't want any dry spots. That's going to mess with our funk pool. We're also going to mark our container so we can 
to keep better track of our little buddy's level of activity, you can use a sharpie, a rubber band, or a piece of tape to keep track of where our mix is starting so we can see the rise and fall. Now we wait. A lot. <laughs> Check on it in 24 hours and see how it's doing. Within the first one to four days, you're gonna see a nice surge of bubbles. That means bacteria and yeasts are eating, but we're not ready to bake with it yet. We have to let them settle in and help them get strong. So we feed our little ones. If you don't see bubbles after the first day, that's okay. Just wait it out, trust your instincts. The bubbles will tell you when your baby is getting hungry. They are proof of activity and breathing and burping. Once we do see this surge of activity, we're gonna separate our starter into two parts. We'll have what's called discard, which you should never actually discard and a small portion of starter that we can continue to feed. We're gonna keep 50 grams of starter and feed it 100 grams of flour along with 100 grams of warmish water. Stir it all together. Mark where your mixture is and keep tabs on it and its bubble activity for the next 24 hours. Again, you can have these suggestions. It should start smelling fruity and maybe a little tangy. Sometimes 24 hours is too much. Sometimes it's not enough. Watch for those bubbles. We're gonna keep on with our feeding schedule, getting used to our starter's wants and needs and adjust accordingly. After the second feeding, we can either keep the rye flour in our feeding schedule or move fully into white flour. Some starters like to be fed once a day, some like to be fed twice a day. I've had my starter for three years now, her name is Sweetie Pie, since we started her from sweet potatoes. She's currently on a twice a day feeding schedule and I feed her a one to two ratio. One part starter, two parts flour, two parts water. When the weather gets warmer, I'll probably up her to a 1-3-3 schedule or else she'll rise to her peak too quickly. You'll notice Sweetie Pie is pretty pale. She's transitioned to all-purpose white flour recently since that's all we have on hand these days. This means she won't be as active as something with more whole grains mixed in and her bubbles aren't going to be as large and strong as something with the high protein power of bread flour. But she's still a happy little one making beautiful things for us. When do we know it's time to feed? Well, our starters are going to double in size with a lot of bubble activity. This is when we really need to keep an eye on them. When our babies stop growing, they will reach a point where they start to plateau and maybe start leaving little divots in their surface. Once our starters start deflating, it's time to feed. After about a week of working with our starter, after we've got a goat rhythm going, we can venture into bread and other products where our starter is the main rising agent. For mixing, when the little divots start to form, that's when we can perform the float test with our starter to make sure it's ready to go. We do this by taking a glass of cold water. We're gonna dip our hands in the water, reach into our starter and gently pull a pinch off the top and drop it off into our water. If it floats, our baby's ready. It means it's producing a healthy amount of carbon dioxide and it's ready to go. If it does not pass the float test, it means one of two things. Your starter has not reached its peak yet and is still eating its way through the food you gave it, or you came to the party a little late and it's already eaten all of its food and now it's sad and hungry. If you think it's the first, give it another try in a half hour to an hour. If you expect it's the second, that's okay. Just save your discard for a different use and go ahead and feed your starter. It just makes for a different opportunity in a few hours. So let's talk about that discard. Well, discard is a beautiful gift that our little microbial buddies are giving to us. Let's use it. We can use it in a variety of recipes where the rise of the product isn't based on using the starter as a leavener. For example, pancakes, cookies, cakes, muffins. The great news is that now with the surge in popularity for sourdough starters, there is so much sourdough content out there. Take advantage of it. So why do we need to have discard? Why can't we just keep feeding all of our starter? Well, if you're not using your starter regularly, but you want to continue feeding it, we go from having a pretty home for our new friends to ending up with a giant house party where all of these guests are eating you out of house and home. Yeast will keep eating and eating and eating and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying as long as there's a food source and you could easily end up with a gallon jug of starter before the end of the week. Sometimes with discard, I don't have enough to make the things I want. So I will tuck it in the fridge and add to it on the following feeding. The cold makes your yeast sleepy, so they won't keep digesting and releasing gases while they wait on us. Speaking of sleepy yeast, let's talk storage. Keeping up with a sourdough means keeping up with a lot of feeding. Let's say you don't want your sourdough to be an everyday project. Let's say you prefer an every week project. Once your sourdough starter is nice and healthy and consistent, you can comfortably leave it in the fridge and feed it once a week to keep it alive and happy. This means once a week, pulling it out of the fridge, letting it grow, feeding the baby, then letting it hang out on the counter for an hour or two, then tucking it back in the fridge for a week long nap. Some people recommend feeding your starter using less water when you're tucking it in for a fridge nap, others say feed as usual. 
test it out, see what works for you. Just know that if your sourdough is dormant for that long, you're gonna wanna feed it two to three times before using it for something like bread. It won't be strong enough otherwise. The point is, as long as you take care of them, these microbes will take care of you. Have faith and have patience. You've got this. I've listed some source material in the YouTube video description if you're interested, and leave a comment if you have any questions, and subscribe if you want to stay up to date on my videos. I can't wait to see the beautiful things you make.